the survivalists are the humans, as far as I'm concerned. They're the people of above average intelligence. They're industrious, they're thrifty. They're basically honest for the most part. And uh, they're very independent. I want to be alive. I want to survive this mess, this calamity of what's happening socially and politically. I want my family to be around so that they could know and learn skills that I'm able to teach them and have children for themselves. They can have an opportunity to grow and learn and be alive and grow to be old men. Well, this kind of an area is the best place for survival because you do have good, basically intelligent, hardworking, decent people, and they're all armed to the teeth, and that's my kind of people. It's worth remembering that unlike most Europeans over 40, most Americans have not seen war on their shores or heard foreign bombers flying over their cities at night. Yet over two million of them are preparing themselves for some form of major disaster. Another 17 million are on the verge of such preparation. They're about to become survivalists. People become survivalists because they perceive some kind of danger that they feel they need to protect themselves from that the government can't or won't protect them from for some reason. Uh, we prepare ourselves usually by moving away from whatever danger it is we perceive, moving away from nuclear targets in my case, and then acquiring the training and the equipment and the supplies to take care of the rest of the dangers of the situation. People uh, in the United States who don't prepare in a nuclear war would have about a 30% chance of living through it. A prepared survivalist living where I am, for instance, has over a 90% chance of living through it. And I don't think anyone seriously disputes that. They do call us paranoid sometimes, uh, but that's not accurate. The danger we envision is real. I can take you out and show you the B-52s and the missiles. Like Bruce Clayton, survivalists also fear a variety of other catastrophes. Imminent social breakdown, riots in the streets, Earthquakes that may devastate Los Angeles in the next nine months, the unavailability of food and essential services, or even worldwide cataclysm beginning this year. Most survivalists are primarily concerned with living through what they see as inevitable nuclear war, and according to a recent New York Times survey, 76% of the United States population think that war will occur in the next 10 years. Uh, we're talking about a danger which could occur during the 1980s, which could kill three quarters of the people in the United States in the worst case, and which could conceivably result in the annihilation or uh, enslavement of Europe and Great Britain. Uh, it's a real danger. I used to say the survivalist was a person who for some reason had put a year's supply of food in his basement. And that seemed to pretty adequately define it. Since then, I've come to the conclusion that a survivalist, uh, a better definition, is someone who has a great deal of faith in his own foresight and no faith at all in the government's foresight. It is our duty as Christians and Americans to learn how to survive, to learn how to survive what's coming on the earth so we can better serve God's people for his name's sake. And part of learning how to survive this thing is proper weapon technique. Knowing how to handle that weapon in combat situation as opposed to a target shooting match. Some of the things we'll be doing is shooting from the waist, point shooting, uh, a new squat position, and shooting on the move both rifle and pistol. Learning how to do these things will increase your ability to defend yourself, your families, 
and your people. We have to be serious and realistic. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right, we need to move out, spread out up the hill, and we'll go into our combat training. Everybody ready? Bruce Clayton, survivalist writer and civil defense director, is one of the gurus of the survival movement. Five years ago, he moved to a remote area of California where he's compiling a directory of America's survivalists, the individuals, the private armies, and the plain crazies. It provides a window into survivalism so people who aren't a part of it, or even people who are a part of it, can really see what kind of people are involved and see everything at once, see their, their education, their politics, their religion, uh, age, family structure, uh, what they're worried about, what they think about, uh, what they think about guns for defense, uh, how they've gone about planning their survival strategy, um, what kind of people they would like to get in touch with, and I also asked them what kind of people they didn't want to get in touch with, which was very illuminating. It's really a cross-section of, of the United States, although there is a, a um, certain tendency toward, toward conservatism, a little to the right of the center. In terms of races, uh, mainly white, but not exclusively white. There are black survivalists, there are Jewish survivalists, Taoists, Buddhists, just all kinds. The mind boggles. There's one example that I think is uh, pretty interesting. Let's see if I can get in here. There he is. Uh, this fellow is an assistant professor who teaches college accredited courses in urban and wilderness survival. Uh, he lives down in the Los Angeles area. Now, whereas I'm primarily interested in nuclear war, uh, since he lives in Los Angeles, uh, he's primarily interested in earthquakes. They're expecting a rather bad one down there, and, and unfortunately, most of the people in the area don't seem to know much about it. One thing that I was very pleased with him about was I asked him would he be willing to feed unprepared neighbors? Now, this is a question I ask all of them. This guy, he said, yes, he would feed them because it's cheaper to feed them than to kill them. <laughs> uh, which is uh, my position exactly. Not only cheaper, but a great deal safer. We're going to be talking about the earthquake and how do you prepare for the thing. And I mean the earthquake. This thing is an earthquake that's going to have uh, effects clear around the world. We're talking about economic displacements. We're going to be talking about tens of thousands of people killed. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars in damages, probably billions of dollars worth of damages. Uh, we could talk about nuclear warfare and what you can do there. While there's a limited amount of, of, of work you can do to protect yourself in that area other than moving, um, there are some specific things that you can do, steps you can take to protect you, particularly if there's a, an attack uh, done by, say, a terrorist group or that kind of thing. I became a survivalist, I guess, just after I got back from Vietnam. I was trained for Vietnam and uh, there were only two things I could do when I came back. One is I could kill, and the other thing was I could survive. And uh, it didn't seem ethical to kill, so I became a survivalist, teaching survival. OK, hon, what I want you to do is to hold the weapon just like this, mm -hmm. put your hand on it there. And when you squeeze the trigger, that's going to put a round in the chamber. Look straight down the sight. That's right. Hold it with both hands. And when you squeeze the trigger, go ahead. Now it's ready to fire. Just keep both eyes on it. See the little round circle? That's a heart. I want you to put three holes in that heart. I keep a variety of weapons around. Um, they, they serve different purposes. I, I could demonstrate. This, uh, this little piece here is a, a push dagger. And uh, it's useful in urban confrontations. It also opens bottle caps, which is an advantage, I think. I have a another little toy that I keep around with me. This this small pistol here is a nine millimeter. It's made in Germany, so it shoots the international cartridges. I'll always have something available for it. In addition to that, there there's this little toy here. This is the old-fashioned sledgehammer 45, 45 uh, ACP. It's a good cartridge and uh, it has what they call one-shot knockdown, so I don't need to waste a lot of ammunition if I'm ever called to shoot something heavy. Um, there's a, another one here. This, this little toy here is a, a 22. 
Uh, some people call these melon poppers or onion field guns. They're, uh, they're useful for self-defense at very close ranges, not, uh, not meant for shooting people off of hills or anything like that. Of course, they're useless for hunting. If you really want to go hunting, this kind of weapon here, this one is a 12-gauge shotgun, a pump. I carried this in Vietnam. Uh, it's an old friend of mine. It, uh, it shoots very, very well. But uh, it's useful inside of a home because it will not penetrate more than a single wall. It'll put a large hole in the wall, but uh, only one wall. So it won't damage your neighbors. I think it's a, of advantage to your neighbors. FBI statistics we find out are telling us one out of every two people will need urban survival skills every five years in the urban environment. In other words, out of every two people in this class, one of you will be involved in a violent crime in the next five years. What does that mean? Does that mean you want to become a victim every five years? One of you? Yeah. You don't want to be a victim. If you're involved in that crime, you at least ought to be a victor. In order to do that, you need to have a few techniques, a few skills, a few items to work with. Now, a lot of the tools people use for urban survival or urban defense are um, illegal. I have a device here in front of me. It's really just my keys. But um, in fact, it's an ancient weapon. The Japanese made these things years ago. And they, they call these things a Manriki Gusari. It's called a chain times 10,000. And you could use this to defend yourself. You know, it, it has an effect on people if you hit them with it. Changes their attitude, whatever you want to say. Um, I try not to hit myself with it. This one here can be used for shaving. It has a coarse edge on it. Uh, what it does is you can drive it into things, something like that. Now, if somebody was to be chasing you and you turned around and said, hello, and put that in their chin, uh, it would probably modify their attitude. And again, you'd still fit inside the statistics, but uh, you wouldn't be the victim. Uh, there are, of course, other ways of dealing with the problem. This would be one of them. Um, anybody have any questions? Yeah, are you suggesting we arm ourselves with, with knives like this, or...? No, I'm not suggesting that you do that. In fact, I think that arming yourself with a knife is uh, probably a mistake. If you had a knife and you used that for protection, it's likely the, the bad guys would take the thing away from you and use it on you. The best skill you can have, I think, in a knife fight is how to run. When you leave this campus today, when you walk out there into that system, you're going to be standing there facing these people once again that are going to be after you and yours. We've got to stop those people. We've got to put them down. Not far from the campus in a Hollywood suburb is one of the many specialist bookstores which have sprung up all over the states. They sell the books and magazines which have flooded the survivalist market. The whole range of survival books are from books on self-defense to first aid, to how to kill explosives. Um, if you, you ever wanted to learn how to build a log cabin or make adobe bricks, we've gone the whole line of, of survival books because we think it encompasses everything that a person needs to do to survive. Some of the books might be regarded as quite extreme. You've got How to Kill Volumes 1 to 5 up there. What's in that? Um, the books How to Kill 1 through 5, you can consider them a source book. I hope I never have to kill anyone, but if I was ever in that situation, I'd rather be knowledgeable and survive. The books are, help, are here to help you in case of that emergency if, if you're going to become the victim. Hidden away in the Ozark Mountains of Mid-America is Kurt Saxon, a survivalist writer who's been accused of encouraging terrorism. This kind of an area is the best place for survival because you do have good, basically intelligent, hardworking, decent people, and they're all armed to the teeth, and that's my kind of people. Saxon is a former black magician, hell's angel, and journalist. His books have become the standard works for the hardcore survivalist. He specializes in writing home recipes for explosives and poisons, and inevitably his books have been banned in many countries. I started writing uh, the survival books in uh, 1975, I realized that when this civilization breaks down, people who survive will need the simple technology of the past to help them rebuild civilization and live very nicely in the same time. And uh, the 19th and early 20th century technology and science can be easily implemented by the layman with materials locally because we won't be able to send to Europe for any parts or uh, Japan or whatever. So everything we make will have to uh, be made locally. So uh, the, the kind of uh, information I'm putting out would, uh, 
be very grand for uh, tourist villages. Shops, factories, the way they did things in the old days, the steam engines, various forms of alternate energy. And, uh, well, now the poor man's James Bond is on improvised weaponry. That tells you how to defend yourself uh, from marauders. Uh, the others, however, uh, let's see, there's the food book will tell you how to cut your food bill by half or more, how to live better even today. And uh, the chemistry book will tell you how to make all the chemicals you need from raw materials and uh, in turn make compounds which you can sell to other people, a shoe polish, toothpaste, so on, and uh, explosives too. And uh, the survivor, of course, has the 19th and early 20th century technology in it all through it. Kurt, aren't you worried that people might misuse these books? No, not at all. It's every man for himself. If uh, people are the type who would misuse them, they ought to be put away or put to sleep. Uh, we have over 80 million social dependents, and if I could press a button and they would all be gone, then everything would straighten out. But I can't find the button, so I'm putting out these books. Don't you think that's a rather extreme way of, of dealing with this situation? Uh, no, because the culling is coming. There's going to be a worldwide holocaust. We have uh, nearly five billion people on this planet as it is, and uh, the, the changing weather patterns is going to wipe out agriculture on a large scale, so those people can't be fed in any way. So they're going to die one way or another. So many survivalists in the field will uh, preface their remarks with, I hope what I'm saying isn't going to happen. Well, I hope that it does, and the quicker the better. Because the quicker it happens, then the quicker we'll have time to build a new society of free, intelligent, uh, fully human beings. Down the road from Kurt Saxon are the Zarephaths. They are armed Christians who believe the world's end starts this year. just basically a bunch of common people that have come together a little bit at a time over the last 10 or 12 years. I was born in Illinois, and I went lived in Texas for several years, and then in the late 60s, uh, God began to deal with us about the economic judgment collapse and upheaval that was coming upon all the world, and especially on this country, and he began to deal with us in the church that I was uh, part of at that time down there to get out of the city, out of the big city. Jim Ellison has formed the Zarephaths into a self-sufficient army to protect themselves against the hordes they feel will be fleeing the collapsing cities. There's no doubt about the seriousness of their military training, as they would say they play it for real. Guards on the gate, men and most women armed all the time, and even children trained to shoot from 12 years old. We have food sufficient for at least a year and possibly more depending on how many people we would take in and we have water stored this is your two basic things that you must have if you're trying to prepare for even temporary emergency and of course since we are not uh, pacifist we have weapons to protect what we have this morning we've got some inclement weather on our hands. It's snowing, but we're still going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead with the training this morning because we need training in snow in various conditions like this. We're also going to have a crew that's going to go cut cedar today, even though you won't be able to haul anything out. We'll go ahead and cut today. You all basically know what your squad is supposed to do today, and you'll check with your squad leader. We'll go right on out to it. All right? Any sure, questions? Yeah. Okay. Let's pray then. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your mercy. We thank you for this snow, and we appreciate the moisture that you're giving us. We know that it'll help the plants and the garden and the pasture to grow better. We just pray that you'd help us today to learn, teach us by every experience that we have. Make us better servants in your kingdom. Just help us, Lord Jesus, to appreciate all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Weapons are more plentiful than money here. A large part of the Zarafat's income is made in the weapons trade and from paramilitary training seminars they give to other survivalists all over the United States. God brought us together. He, he's bringing together a remnant of people to carry on when the thing collapses, when the, someone has to start building again. And so he's brought together a people so they can pick up the pieces when there's nothing to pick up and build over. It feels like real soon. If not, we're still done what the Lord said. He said to be ready, to be watching all the time. What do you say to the people around here who might feel that you people are crazies? They thought Jesus was crazy too. So if he can do it, we can do it. He's our example. First technique I'm going to show you is called waist shooting. What it is, it's if you're walking along and something jumps up real close to you, you can shoot from the waist without ever having to bring your gun up. As you tuck the rifle stock up against your body, you try to get the rifle as level as possible. You concentrate on where you want your bullet to go. Okay, your elbow needs to be tucked in right here. We believe we have the right to train and know how to use a weapon in case if we need to use it, we'll be ready. I feel like I'm, I belong here and that something is definitely going to happen. Just everything's going to go wrong and I need to be prepared and I need to be able to survive and this is the place where I can learn. Ready? Aim. Fire! We can't just sit around and act like nothing's going to happen because we, we know that something's going to happen, so we need to prepare ourselves, not just say, well, all the men can, can learn all that they need to learn, and we can just kind of sit down and say, go out there and take care of everything because it's better to be prepared than not. I hope that the men will be able to protect us, but if an enemy came in within the boundaries, and was to walk in my home, I would believe I'd have the right to grab a rifle or pistol or a knife and use it on him. Fire! Now warm and snug, they all look out upon the flood and round about. Of Zeb's new house, there's not a trace, just water now, where was his place? He shakes his head, does Zebedee. Why did I act so foolishly? I think a house could stand if built on nothing more than sand. The house got washed away that was built on sand, didn't it? Uh -huh. I, Daniel was a little kitty cat. Daniel and kitty, if you want There she is, waving hi. Life here, in one sense, is real easy. And in another sense, it's real hard because sometimes, sometimes you're required to share things. <laughs> and, you know, we know we should, but sometimes it's really hard to give up personal things. But whenever we do, the Lord always returns it a hundredfold and blesses us for it. Okay, Michael. Birds. Birds? What kind of birds? Owls. Let's see, owls have big round eyes, don't they? Now, what do they say? We are trying to prepare a place as a refuge for people to come. We're storing food and clothes and, of course, I can't tell you where or how much, but we're preparing and we're, as you know, we have our own army and I feel like the Lord's blessed it. He's ordained it. Now, the reason we're out here in this snow in the mud and blood is to learn how to stay alive. And the way we learn is to do it just as realistically as we can. And the more realistic that you play it, the more you'll learn. 
try to keep from getting tickled when somebody gets blowed up. Remember to take cover if an explosion goes close to you. If anybody gets hurt, you holler medic and David will assist you. If you fall down, keep going. But play it, and play it hard, and we'll learn a lot. It is our responsibility as Christians to survive the coming hard times. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just teach us your ways of war. Teach us how to love and how to hate. Just bless us, Jesus, and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Most people on the outside have not trained themselves to realize that if there is a limited nuclear attack, many people think of just a, a complete wipeout, but if there's a limited nuclear attack, there will be cars upon the highways and hundreds of thousands, a complete disruption of the, of the economy and the government as we know it, and people will come out in, from the cities. Survival is also a situation of being able to hold on to a, an, a weapon a weapon to protect yourself, because you know that other people may not think the same way you think, in, in, in a manner that they will attack you. They will ravish your women. They will do anything they possibly can to get what they want, simply because they do not have the Spirit of the Lord in them. They're simply looking to survive. This is a situation that we are preparing ourselves for, defending ourselves for, but we do plan to survive. And be ye lift up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Mostly what we're doing is just uh, what Jesus described in the scriptures when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the time of the coming of the Son of Man be. At that time, there was a great deal of wickedness and a great deal of evil among mankind on the earth. And he warned Noah that he was going to destroy the earth because of the evil that was in it. spent 100 years, over 100 years, building that ark. I'm sure that people thought he was absolutely crazy. You know, there hadn't, there wasn't any rain, and, you know, and here he'd spent years and years and years at it. And they probably told him he was a fanatic and paranoid, but it's the same. I, I know that we're not paranoid, but I believe that out of reverence for God, if he tells us that something's going to happen, we believe him and we will move with fear just like Noah did to prepare a place for our people. We've given up everything we own on a large scale. We've given up our lives and our big jobs. We've offered ourselves up to try to save America. And according to a logical view, that's not reasonable. That's crazy. Because it's not profitable, it's not popular, and we could quite possibly end up getting killed for it. But nevertheless, we're going to do it. I don't like to set dates, but it's feeling kind of spooky. And it might be tomorrow or sometime in 82. 
but uh, it could last another 10 years, but I don't think so. The Bible says it's going to wax worse and worse. And when you go into these big cities and there are streets that you can't walk down without being thumped, you know it's getting bad. When homosexuality is in open view and not hidden anymore, you know it's getting bad. When witchcraft and communism is everywhere, you know it's getting bad. Everybody looked real good in the skirmish. Remember, to not get ahead of anybody else, but to keep your line straight. This will avoid being shot in the back. When you come down both sides of the street, be sure to cover the other side of the street also. And uh, your timing was real good on going from door to door and from alley to alley. The Zarephaths are among the mail order customers of this army surplus warehouse in Los Angeles. Here you can buy anything from a camouflage suit to a tank for your war games. Survival is now big business in the States running into billions of dollars. Our survivalist customers are are a variation of people from young and old to rich and poor. Mostly on the, on the richer side or the upper income of people involving themselves from, from the smaller urban survival all the way up to, to wilderness survival depending on what their particular needs they feel will be. Food, uh, personal gear, maps, uh, different equipment like that that will protect themselves, different types of weapons, different types of material to bury things so that they will have these products when they need them and, and where they need them. Uh, our largest survival purchase has been in excess of $10,000. The majority of that has been for food and foodstuffs. The survival market is growing because of what's happening in the world today. The world tension, the potential race problems, the problems with earthquake that we're prone to in this particular area. All of these things make people more aware of what could happen and make them focus on, on their own personal survival. It's not extreme living on top of a mountain. Because of having a very good strategic vantage point, I control who comes up here. Uh, we have telescopes. Uh, there's any number of hidden barricades within the road and even with necessary, I, I could uh, control the <laughs> person's coming up. I won't get into full detail on that, however one can use his imagination. But uh, as for being extreme, no, I don't think it's extreme. I like it up here. There's a lot of things that I can do up here that I can't do on the flatlands. Like many survivalists, Fred Kirpsey and his family moved to the surrounding desert to escape the soaring crime rate of Los Angeles. I'm self-sufficient in many ways. Anyways, there's not one public utility that I have up here that I have to buy. I've got my own power. I have a generator. It's a diesel generator made in England. Uh, it produces enough power for three houses. I have my own water supply. I buy from a man that brings it up in a huge truck, and I'm drilling a, my own water well in a natural spring, so I'll be able to supply my own water. We're working on a wind power system. I've got things, goods, um, repair items, machine shop, uh, power sources, a whole bit like this. And there's going to be people who want this. And I'm going to be in a situation where they're going to have one hell of a time trying to get it from me. Number one, it belongs to me and my family. Number two, I'm willing to share it with whoever needs it. But if somebody goes to take it, I'll defend it. Do you see that happening? It's happening now. This is happening now. This situation where people want things is happening now. If they can't get it one way or another, they'll get it another way. Where we came from in L.A., it's bad. Everything is. Crime in the streets, people shooting each other, I mean, and, you know, killing over small things, and uh, the conditions are really bad. So up here, we don't have to worry about it. But we take care of ourselves. I'm going to live here and provide for my family. Because I love my family. I'm going to learn the things that there are about nature and provide uh, the food and uh, substance necessary to support my family.
On the other side of America, in a secretive, highly protected mercenary training school outside Atlanta, Georgia, $3,000 will buy you a place on a course teaching you how to survive the most violent situations. All of you are essentially here for the same reason. That's executive protection. We have some professional uh, bodyguards. We have some military. We have some uh, ex-military. The school, as you know, will last for 10 days. The camp's owner, General Werbel III, veteran of many wars, runs the school with ex-officers of the unconventional warfare branch of the U.S. Army. When you go to your quarters at night, you should be tired enough to eat and go to bed. We don't particularly like you chasing around the bars because you've got to be up and alert and moving in the morning. That's it. Now we'll uh, show you a very interesting film that'll make you think. And then after that, question and answer period, and then we go to work. This may look like a Soviet weapons parade in Moscow's Red Square on May Day, but it's taking place in Monagro... Werbel shows propaganda films like this one on El Salvador, made by the American Security Council, to make sure, he says, that the students think right. A violent power struggle rages in El Salvador. More than 20 people die each day in civil war. Arms and Castro-trained guerrillas pour into El Salvador, strengthening the terrorist forces. As rapidly growing numbers of guerrilla insurgents move into the country to force Guatemala into the mold of Cuba. We opened it as a commercial endeavor. The reason we did it was because America was in line for exactly what's happening in Europe today. In fact, it had already started here. Uh, people in the United States are normally great optimists. You know, we always think it isn't going to happen here, but it's happening here. And what we're trying to do is teach people that's the awareness of this situation. That's the time you don't think of that's a weapon. Imagine you in danger. Don't always imagine, oh, I'm safe. This is a peaceful world. You know damn well there ain't no peaceful world. Since the world started, there ain't no peaceful. People hunt for food. People hunt for power. People fight for power. You get a job, hey, he got the job. You want the same position, what they do? Try to, ah, this guy's no good. Yeah, let's take him outside, beat the hell out of him. Every time, everywhere, it's all violence. I'm not here to teach you to become a terrorist. But if you want to defend yourself, you must know more than terrorists know. Know how would they move? How can you prevent it? And this is the main key. Certain people are, are essential objectives. The, the famous, the rich, the political right wing, uh, and just the plain ordinary man who, for example, has a fancy automobile, an expensive automobile, is known to go to nightclubs and spread it around. They're, they're, they are targets of opportunity. And more and more of these people uh, are being kidnapped, uh, beat up, mugged, killed, right on the street. We've had got so much of it here in Atlanta. Now, remember what I said. When you're not punching, you relax your fist. Don't keep on yeah, squeezing it. Where's your energy? Now, leave your leg there and watch me plant my weight. You yeah. feel it? Now, that's what happens there. Now, if I was to apply the pressure, the correct pressure when I came down, I would break your knee here because I locked you in there. You feel it? Yeah. Either you're going to go down or you're going to break. If you fight against it, I will break it. Yeah. Make one movement, clear. Just bring it in and plant it. If the economy doesn't make a change for the better, and if people can't find jobs and can't make a living, they are going to resort to what they will have to do, roving bands preying on the haves. The have-nots preying on the haves. Ready? Back to the center. We teach to avoid confrontation whenever possible. Be totally alert. 
Be aware of your surroundings. Be conscious of everything that happens around you. Everything is unusual. It's a hell of a way to have to live, but if you're gonna live, that's the way you better live. Hey! Ready? And if you can avoid a confrontation, avoid it. If you're at a point where you can't avoid it and you're seeing that happen every day you go to classroom here, then attack it. But attack it to kill. These people don't deserve to live. These people are vicious animals. We always face the opponent face to face. Okay? You don't understand that part, right? Don't punch this way. Oh, I see. You always imagine you have a person in front of you. Okay? And that's your target. Yes. Whenever you, whenever you strike, if you turn to the left, mm -hmm. your right hand should be forward because mm -hmm. that's the closest to your right. object, right? Okay. Snap it out. Snap it out like a wet towel. Just let it, let it loose. Okay? Ready? Hey! Good. Back. Ready? And we are an anti-terrorist school, and we teach Ready? people to defend themselves. Hey! We teach them to survive. We teach them basic countermeasures. We don't teach them to be aggressive, to go out and look for trouble. Matter of fact, we tell people if there's any opportunity at all, run. Get away from danger as fast as you can. But there's a time when you can, and you have to stand and fight, and that's what we teach them to do. But you teach them to kill as well? If necessary. Oh, is shooting a gun that you're gonna learn at this cotton picking school, and that is that right there. I told the United States Army the only part in the expression, the only D thing that they ever had going for them as far as teaching a person to shoot was pull it on, and it didn't have a D thing to do with shooting a gun. Right now, the average person doesn't really realize what terrorism is. They, uh, there's too many classes in the United States. It's not just two classes like we have in a lot of the South American countries. And, uh, it's, it's going to get a lot worse, much worse. The English shoot a gun square-shouldered, square-footed, so to speak. They bring your gun up, they extend the left hand as far out here as they can. They ride on one thing, the left hand puts a gun on the target. You do not aim a gun, you do not lead a bird, and this, that, and other, and that's the English. They do know how to shoot them. There are a bunch of people in the United States that think they're going to dig themselves in, you know, and when the breakout comes and it's going to come it's going to come in the cities first uh what they think they're going to do the idiots is to climb in the bomb shelters and uh, go up to their enclaves in the mountains which we have right here in georgia some of my friends are building an enclave where they're all going to retreat and the damn thing's like a fortress like a walled city where they're gonna have all their dried food and all their bottled water and special wells and loopholes, the firing holes in the walls and all this kind of business. They think they're gonna survive. That's ridiculous. You don't run away from it. You fight it. Now I'm gonna put you in five of them. We have as long as we can make it, and as long as the people will fight back. And that, I hope, is forever. Put it up, close your left eye, go get the top of your target. Top of it. Put it up, don't turn your gun down, okay? Go get the top of that one. Back now, can you handle the gun? but depends on the individuals. Our country depends on individuals. And yet there are a lot of socialists, communists, all of which I class as idiots, that for some reason or other think that living under that type of totalitarian government is gonna be better. I mean, there are more idiots in the world than there are non-idiots.
uses his people. He said, you are my battle axe and my weapons of war. Amen. We must not be afraid of what's coming because a storm is surely coming. They go to battle under a red flag and a red star. Try to bring dominion, their dominion, which is dominion of Satan and evil to the world. I thank God that he's beginning to open the eyes of the people. That they might know who he is. That he is Jehovah, God of hosts, who says in the scripture, I, the Lord, am a man of war. He is not an emaciated, weak, effeminate, hippie. Elijah took a sword, didn't he? And killed the prophets in the brook. Samuel, the, the prophet and judge of Israel that anointed David and Saul, took a sword and hewed Agag with a sword himself and put him to death. He shall surely raise up that man child. And that man shall rule with the rod of iron. This is the closest thing to a rod of iron that we've got today. Amen. And this rod of iron that's predicted in the scripture is pictorial or it pictures force because God will cause his man-child overcomer to rule with force, both natural force and spiritual force.